felt today because there's, you know, there, there are lots of terms used around um, our topic, which is hybrid learning. We thought it would be a good thing to start with something of a, a, a definition. So online learning, obviously, we understand that that means learning wholly online. But two other terms, blended and hybrid, maybe need some clarification. So I'm going to ask Dr. Ken Beatty to start us off there with an answer to that question. What's the difference? Blended, great. hybrid. OK, great. Just before I start, Phil and Leonor, you might want to turn off your microphones just while, you know, so we don't get those background sounds. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Jane. Uh, yeah, it's a big topic. And I actually want to start with another little question, which is why do we need a definition? Why do we need a model? Uh, well, we need a model for so that everybody knows what we're talking about. Uh, students, teachers, administrators, parents. If you say online learning, as you say, people recognize that that's, everything is being done online. The students are not meeting. Blended learning, uh, that means a mixture of uh, going online and also having some classes. So some sort of arrangement like that. And then uh, hybrid learning, which is <laughs> uh, the wicked stepchild of the entire uh, <laughs> a list of definitions. It's very, very difficult. I went uh, in preparation for this, I skimmed through about 100 articles trying to find what is the difference. And frankly, the answer in 95% of them is nothing. Uh, a lot of people, use the terms interchangeably. They say hybrid learning when they're talking about uh, blended learning, and it just seems to be a personal choice. But for the purposes of today, I tried to come up with something, well, what is different? What can we do beyond blended learning? And beyond blended learning, very simply, what we can do is we can add one little component which is something to do in the community. So taking learning outside of the classroom, and so many teachers do this already, but finding something in the community. At the adult level, that's probably going to be some things like uh, internships, all other levels. It could be something like volunteering. But even it can be things like going out into the community and getting some information for your, uh, for your, for your classwork. So say if I'm studying, you know, I don't know, food in the classroom, everybody does. Why why not ask the students to say, go out, go out and see if you can find photographs. Use your cameras because every student has one. Uh, use the cameras on your phone and uh, just take a few photos of uh, food with English writing on it that you see in your community. Now, I've traveled around the world like everybody here uh, on the panel and uh, so many countries. And I haven't been anywhere where I don't see English written on uh, menus, when I don't see English written, you know, some on posters or advertisements or something like that. So that's just a simple example of how we take the learning outside or ask the students to. During this time of COVID-19, a lot of things are not available yet, but slowly opening up. Uh, I live in Montreal. Uh, and in Montreal, we just are reopening the libraries after so long. So that means we're opening other opportunities as well. We're opening book clubs. Uh, we're opening, you know, ESL classes that are offered through the libraries. Uh, very, very slowly, extra resources are coming into play that I can't offer in my classroom online and is more difficult to offer in the traditional classroom. So I, again, I, I, I expect pushback. I welcome pushback from everybody for their own definitions. But we really just need to start with something. And I think that community uh, part is important. Otherwise, really, you have to ask yourself, is it just blended learning in another with another hat on? Something like that. How's that? Maybe maybe Autumn wants to weigh in on this one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I thought that was an excellent definition, Ken. Um, and I think that there's one other thing to take into consideration um, with hybrid learning is that I feel like, at least in the United States, from a K through 12 perspective, hybrid learning is also is synonymous with damage control. So we can say that in a textbook definition of hybrid learning, we have that blended learning component. But now when we try to define hybrid learning, it's more like, what has each school done contextually to respond to the pandemic? And I think really hybrid learning in a nutshell is about creating equity. Because what we now have is we have students going to school, we have students staying home, we have students remote learning in their own classroom with their own teacher, we have students learning in the classroom with their own teacher, and then we have another version of hybrid learning where we have a teacher teaching students at home with a live stream while they also have students in the classroom. So it's also kind of this catch 
all term, where we have this standard model that Ken is talking about, where we have blended learning combined with community language learning and going out into the community and bringing in all the resources to really maximize this combination of on-site and at home learning. And now we have this reality of the pandemic where hybrid learning has become this catch all for how on earth do we teach all students in an equitable manner? And what strategies are we as a school at a university setting, in an adult ed setting, in a K through 12 setting, going to meet the needs equitably of all of the different students that we have. So everybody is kind of doing this in a way that makes the most sense for them in terms of the funding they have and the resources that they have and the training that they have. And the problem that we face is where are the students who cannot access our classes, who have just fallen off the face of the planet? And that is the problem that we're dealing with in the United States um, is really we've lost some students for an entire year with hybrid learning. And how do we make up for that? Oh, I'm looking at the chat and someone just said that so, Ken Beatty looks like my dad. <laughs> I don't mean to get distracted, but that comment was just too wonderful to let slip by. <laughs> like my dad, I see that, yes. Oh, nice. Yeah, ask, ask your mother. Yeah, there we are. <laughs> so, Good. Okay. <laughs> that's, that, that's my two cents. I'm not really going to speak from a learning design perspective, really, because it's just been just been figuring out what each school needs and how they're going to meet those needs. So there really isn't a standardized approach from a learning design perspective. It's just yeah. trying to maintain equity. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm guessing, I mean, um, Autumn, you now have the challenge of creating some kind of learning design that works for these new circumstances. But during this year, the kind of challenges that people have been facing in the classrooms are sort of circumstances. I think, Phil, perhaps you can give us some insights there into what's been happening. Autumn spoke about the United States. What's it been like in, in your world? Well, um, when, when the pandemic happened and everything started to lock down, um, I'm still employed by a, a UK company and I was put on furlough but it didn't give me a lot to do. Uh, so a friend of mine here in, in Czechia said, you don't know anyone who's looking for uh, some teaching work in a secondary school. And I said, well, that'll be me. It's about time I got back in a classroom. And um, so it was, it was great to be in the secondary school. At the time where we had our week before the semester started, uh, all the teachers were together face to face and we were asked to map out um, our curricula for, for the year. And a lot of that was assuming it was going to be face-to-face -face regular teaching. And of course, after about two weeks, uh, the numbers rose and some of the students went to online learning, some of the students stayed, and then we started to get um, uh, positive um, COVID cases in classes. So we'd have a situation where uh, I was due to teach a class at two o'clock, and I was told at 10 o'clock, actually, we sent that class home. So uh, can you can you perhaps try and do something with them at home or send them uh, some some uh, some homework? And I think it's a tale of two cities. I think I think uh, the, the videos that Ken has put out and the training that's been available for teachers have, have made the situation in September last year very different to the situation it is now. But I have to tell you, what have I learned from, from my experience? Well, I've learned, you've got to think on your feet. Uh, you've, you've got a situation where um, you might have planned regular classes and suddenly you have to teach online classes with some of the students. As Autumn said, you have a situation where some of the students have tested positive, but they have no symptoms. They want to join classes. So you want to include them. So you have some students face to face and students joining remotely. Um, I teach teenage students, uh, older teenagers. Um, there are lots of different caveats that uh, we assume teenagers are experts in technology. But actually, with a new form of teaching, you have to create new working practices. Uh, so there are issues about uh, breakout rooms. When do you leave a breakout room? Uh, what, what happens in a breakout room? There are huge issues over cameras. Uh, so I've attended quite a few training in the UK where the, they say you've got to keep the cameras on at all time for child safeguarding purposes. 
Um, in the Czech Republic, it's a little bit less stringent. And I have to say, at, at eight o'clock in the morning, when I start teaching, um, teenage students don't want to share cameras in their bedrooms. And in a way, I'm quite happy that they don't either, because I don't particularly want to see them in their, in their pajamas as they're, as they're looking in. Um, initially, my colleagues, 21st century skills got dumped. It was testing, testing, and more testing unfortunately. Um, one or two apps that they had used in the classroom became overused outside of the classroom. Um, and I think that the, the students got bored with it. Um, not all course books are the same. Those teachers who had course books who had uh, online components found the glide really easy or a far easier in terms of allocating work and, and, and using the course book online than those, those teachers who didn't have those resources. So, so that was something that was notable amongst the colleagues. Um, autonomy. Autonomy, uh, we sort of assume, is, is how students work in isolation. But I think what, what this has taught myself and my colleagues is autonomy is something teachers can very much get involved in and in, in improving uh, uh, the student's ability to work online. Um, and I think, I think the most exciting thing, is, as Autumn mentioned, um, teaching's never going to go back to how it is or how it was, you know? So this is really exciting for us. I don't know if you want to, to, to add anything to that or if anyone feels like adding it. Yeah, there, there have been some really interesting comments in the chat as well, um, referring to, for example, parts of the world where people perhaps don't have internet at all. Um, others who say that in, online learning could be boring, missing physical contact, um, all those black rectangles on the screen. So lots of really interesting comments coming here, which we're all looking at as well. And generally, we're, we're going to try to kind of define those challenges first before we look at some solutions. But talking about the challenges, um, Leonor, Anything that you'd like to add to what um, what <laughs> Phil has been describing from your perspective? Yes. Yeah, sure. And I want to uh, just uh, go back to this concept of equity that uh, Autumn was talking about. Uh, in this region, I mean, not everybody has internet access. So teachers, I mean, we just went uh, into lockdown from, I mean, overnight. So that meant that many students had, hadn't even started school. I mean, remember that we start classes in March in this, I mean, in the Southern Hemisphere. So no contact with teachers, no, uh, no materials, no resources. I mean, just nothing. And uh, sometimes even in middle class homes, I mean, there isn't just one computer or one device for every student or for every member. So with the two parents or the two adults working in the house doing home office and then maybe two kids. So that was very difficult. And uh, sometimes students had to join with a, with a mobile device. I mean, just imagine having a lesson on this, uh, uh, this high screen. And many teachers, what they did because of this uh, wish to reach everybody, I mean, as far as they could, I mean, they sent homework and classes and videos and everything uh, on WhatsApp messages, emails. So teachers really went to extremes to make things happen, to try to connect with their learners. Uh, sometimes teachers, when, I mean, at schools, in state schools, I mean, food was given to families every, uh, every two weeks. And so teachers would go to the schools, I mean, and just print copies for students to get in touch with English, because that would be the only uh, possibility. So I do want to stress the role of a teacher how much everything will depend on teacher. I and mean, you may have all the resources in the world, but if you don't have a person, a human being, who wants to commit to make a compromise, I mean, I don't think learning uh, can happen. And of course, it's much more challenging. I mean, the younger the learner, the more challenges you face as a teacher. But uh, still, I think that this is what I was referring to yesterday when everybody speaks about lost learning because they work on just concepts. But if you think about the autonomy that students have gained, uh, the resources that they discover they have, I mean, how much they've been reflecting, there might be, I mean, there might have been some losses, but the gains are uh, enormous. 
Mm. So that's what I, I want to add to stress. So interesting uh, even, one. Even yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ken, I think you're on mute. Ken's on mute. Can you? Got it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, just to just to uh, take up something that Leonor was saying about this idea of lost learning, and of course, Autumn's pointing out that students have just dropped out of the entire system. What is the effect? How long does it take to catch up with that? Well, fortunately, there was an economist in uh, in New Orleans who did a study of this after the uh, after the Hurricane Katrina incident that they had there. That closed schools for about three months. And so he, he did a, a study, long-term study, looking at how long did it take students to catch up after missing three months of school. The answer, surprisingly, was two years. Two years before they got up to the same level as well as continuing to learn what they were expected to learn two years so you think about this year that many students have uh, spent without learning and we're really talking about you know uh, uh, several years for them all to catch up I think there will be kind of a generation uh, who is the COVID generation basically who missed part of their learning and you think about I think about all the things that we can do online as English teachers and we're pretty fortunate but I also think about students who are studying science can't go to a lab can't go to a chemistry lab aren't you know doing physics experiments and all of a sudden you know that's a that's also a whole other level of difficulty for those students so yeah my mm -hmm. ideas Bill yeah Phil, go ahead unmute I I would I would sort of add we're obviously talking about the uh, the digital divide and disadvantaged uh, students who don't have access to technology. But even if we look at uh, students from first world countries with technology, what I found is initially the students missed their classmates when we went online. Um, but it took about three months, but now they're missing the lessons. So I think there is an awareness there that they, they are losing out. And especially those students who are in their final year of secondary, they're beginning to panic about that loss. Yeah. Okay, so we've gone through quite a list of challenges there and more challenges again coming up in the chat box and comments that, that people are making, which are very you know interesting, revealing comments that we'll be picking up on. Um, I'd like to now just move it on a step towards how we're solving those challenges and maybe some some thoughts that you have about the positives, which Leonor, you alluded to what we've gained in this period. So lost learning, yes, you know, all the challenges we've described. Could you perhaps, Leonor, make sure your mic's on, um, give us some thoughts around the positives, the ways that online learning actually might help us to move forward um, in, in spite of all those challenges. Sure. I think that, I mean, on the one hand, I, uh, I agree with what Phil said. I mean, that students started missing, I mean, not only as classmates, but, you know, the contact with the teachers, the lessons. I mean, they just wanted to get together at school. So that's something positive because then students got to value education. Yes, it's not just about learning concepts, but valuing the role of uh, and the importance of education. So that's one uh, one gain to me. The other one is from the point of view of teachers. Uh, when finding that they have to do things in a completely different way and that you meet your students at fewer periods a week, then teachers had to go to their syllabuses or their syllabi and revisit them, reorganizing contents, prioritizing, mainly in terms of learning objectives or skills of situations and not so much in terms of uh, structures or, you know, the teaching points or the lexical areas that they have to teach. So I don't think these teachers who revisited their syllabi would go back to, you know, teaching items in isolation, but understanding how English is a language and at such it's uh, part of our social practices. So I think that's, again, I mean, teachers just lived it. So uh, I don't think uh, many will go back to, you know, teaching unit one, unit two, unit three in the way they used to. That's a really interesting point. Um, Phil, did you want to pick up on that? So so I'm a little bit of a, a dinosaur, but they say a, a, a sort of a, a, a good teacher never stops learning. And um, I think one of the things that mistakenly I assumed with blended learning 
was that the online component was the self-study component. And, um, and taking up what Ken said about uh, this hybrid learning has a sense of, of community. Um, when, when we go back to, to a regular teaching environment, uh, there's no way I'm going to teach every class in the classroom. We are going to have lessons where we go out and, and we, we use the environment and we visit museums and we use the, the, uh, the technology that's available to have synchronous lessons with technology with students outside in the community. And I, I think if we all try to embrace something new, teaching is going to be very exciting. I'd, I'd add to that. Yeah, absolutely. Completely agree. Is that, uh, yeah, there's going to, everybody's going to be looking at what worked right now, but there's going to be pressure. There's going to be enormous pressure from students. And uh, I mentioned in, uh, yesterday my, uh, my 50, uh, my 19 year old in second year university, it's been fantastic for him, the online classes. He's studying computer science and mathematics. The mathematics, you know, is very high level and, and it's difficult if you just have a lecturer droning on for an hour and you're supposed to be picking it up at 8.30. He can sleep in, he watches it, he goes to the sections he doesn't understand, he watches them again and again and again until he really has it. And overall, the studies that have been done, there was a, a landmark study that's been done that's saying actually learning online is probably higher. And <clears throat> Something I suspect is that absenteeism is much lower. Uh, someone in the chat box said that they had 98% attendance. Probably, they probably have 70 during you know regular classes or something. But even if a child is sick at home, they can still turn on their computer and participate in some way. So yeah, there are, there are parts of it. The difficulty I think will be con uh, convincing administrators that this is worthwhile. And as you say, Phil, uh, oh yeah, I'm just taking my class to the museum. You're what, you know? And so that's gonna be, you know, writing memos and filling out forms and doing everything else. And I think there will be pushback from some administrators, but I think as teachers, we have to push to do what's right, yeah. <laughs> I think, I think this, this brings the whole issue of working practices. Um, we need to, you know, in, in, in both a, a national level and in a, in a school level, you need to have clearly defined working practices for working face-to-face, -face, working online, hybrid learning, blended learning. And, and this whole pandemic for me has, 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 has sort of raised issues because of course, when you're working with a group of teachers, and you have different teachers using different platforms, using different uh, 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 sort of um, work practices. It's very hard for the, the students to, to work out what's going on, you know, because they move from, from let's say, Teams one minute to, to Zoom the next minute to Google Classroom the next minute. And I think, I think it does require some sort of, uh, at, at a higher level, embracing the fact that you have to choose the certain system. Interesting. Yeah. Any other comments on those positives before we move to the next? Just day? to add, just to add to that, something thing. we mentioned yesterday as well is you know we you know you, they're moving from class to class and every teacher is doing something different. But unlike unlike you know the traditional classroom where you had the staff room where you met at recess, where you met at lunch hour, where you met after school and could say, how's it going? What are you doing? What, what's useful? What's working? I have this problem. Oh, here's a solution. Uh, the teachers need to create virtual staff rooms to share some of the best practices that they're seeing out there. And exactly what you say, Phil, to sort of maybe uh, take the best practices and employ them across the board for the, for the benefit of the students, yeah. Mm. Actually, I think I will add something of my own there, unscripted, um, <laughs> which is that I work obviously for, for Pearson English and one of our jobs that we do, one of our tasks is to organise events and to make sure that we have interesting speakers like these, <laughs> those of you who are here today um, for, for those who are attending the events. Now, face-to-face -face events, even international events, you would normally find that maybe 30 people, 50 people, maybe 200 people will have the opportunity to attend a talk by one of our speakers because of the cost of travel, because of not being able to get to those places and carry on doing your job, your day job during, um, during the same time. So now we're finding that the kind of events that we organize, this kind of thing, we're getting literally 
thousands of people joining together. Those of you who are joining in the chat, you're part of this conversation. And we're actually able to all kind of communicate together in a way that was much less likely before, or maybe was more accessible to the privileged few who had the, the opportunity to travel from event to event. So that's kind of something that I think is also a, a positive here. Um, but, but in spite of that, I'll come on to the next topic that we have here. Um, many parents in particular, but also learners, are concerned because they believe that online learning is not as good. They believe that the blended and hybrid models that their, teach, their children are, uh, are working, uh, are studying in, are perhaps not working so well. And maybe as a, as a teacher, maybe as an educator, you do need to reassure and provide some kind of, um, you know, evidence to those to those parents or to those learners that online learning can actually work. So I'm going to start out with Ken here. What's your view on that? Um, how can we reassure those doubters that online work, online teaching might be a, a good thing? Absolutely. <laughs> um, well, first of all, I have to say that one thing that COVID has done more than anything else is convince parents that teachers have enormous worth. <laughs> Anybody who's been homeschooling three sort of, you know, uh, under 10 year olds basically is, you know, in, in going insane and thinking, oh my goodness, I, I've never appreciated teachers so much in my life as I do now. So I think that is, I think that is something. Um, uh, so we do recognize that the teachers are doing something. I think everybody does generally realize that this is a transitional thing. It's a struggle. It's something we're doing in the meantime. It's kind of a war term, war uh, time measures that we're taking to sort of get through. But afterwards, we'll have to continue and sort of think, how do we justify it? Well, uh, first of all, for right now, one of the things that we're doing is uh, the greatest thing that we do in school is we teach students how to learn and how to continue learning on their own. And as they, uh, uh, this is not going to disappear in the workplace or anywhere else or in universities. So as younger children go through the system, they're gonna be adept at learning online because they're developing their own strategies. They're compensating for shortcomings that maybe the teacher can't provide and they're finding new ways. And families are a big part of that. They're often working with their kids in different ways. Maybe uh, I know that some teachers have been handing out reading lists and saying, here's a, here's a group, here's a bunch of storybooks you can get from the library or online or free websites. And so all of a sudden, parents are becoming much more involved in the educational process in some cases. But the simple fact is, it, you know, we can't avoid it right now. Maybe it's not as uh, as effective in some cases uh, for uh, for uh, you know compared to face to face learning, but it's here to stay, and it's it does have some advantages which we've already uh, outlined. Uh, I go, going back to what Autumn said about being equitable. Equitable. I mean, in some cases, you know, if you live in a good neighborhood, the libraries down the street, or you're in a house like when I was a kid, I envied those children whose parents had an encyclopedia set right you know the 26 volumes of something i just i just would have died to have that and we didn't have that in our house but we live close to a library you think about the kids who don't have those sorts of resources but one thing we do have is the internet so again if they do have internet access there's so much available for them in videos that they can watch and you know things that they can read so but part of the teacher's role is directing them towards that or organizing other students to collect a series of resources that they share with everyone so which is always my thing make it the student's responsibility yeah someone else yeah great I, i'd say there are there has been some really now i think you you have to divide primary and secondary so so obviously uh secondary school students the students i teach uh don't need parental supervision when they're attending lessons um, but one of the great things, I, I, I started in September, and when we had to flip suddenly, I asked some of my students to record themselves and send me their uh, recording. And all of the students automatically sent me a recording, uh, all on different platforms, but it was fine. And so just before Christmas, I asked them to do the same task and send me another recording again. And then when it came to a parents' meeting, I could send the parent their kids recordings and uh, and I, I sort of this was the stepping board for actually sharing information 
the platform I use, uh, Zoom, I can record the lessons occasionally and I can edit it so that they can actually see their, their student interacting with me. Obviously, because of uh, I don't do it all the time, it's too teacher centered. But I find that parents really enjoy having that. You, you're actually in the classroom and you can see your students improving. Uh, I have friends who work in primary, and one of the things that one of my uh, uh, primary school colleagues has done, which has proved an, an incredible success, is she holds a, a weekly uh, sort of webinar for the parents. She discusses what songs they're going to use and everything else, and she gives the parents some guidelines because she realizes that a lot of the time it's reinforcement and recycling. And that parent group, it was it started with one or two of the keenest parents, you know, the ones that are fastest to complain that there's been a loss. And it's grown to include all of the parents in, in one of her classes. So uh, there, are, there are lots of advantages that, that parents don't initially see that if as we become more experienced practitioners with the technology, we can introduce to them and, and they embrace it wholeheartedly. I don't know if anyone wants to add a, anything yeah. to that. I think Autumn had something to say possibly about also the kind of research that we've been able to carry out into this. Would you like to, to pick up there? Yeah, it, well, I mean, I have to say it's kind of too soon to, to you know, there, we're still waiting. We're, we, we're assessing students now where you know everybody's waiting to see okay what's the proof of learning now how are the students actually doing let's have some wider you know government run assessments on that which is really challenging i also am kind of speaking to this as a mom of two kids under 6 years old so um so and also working full time so i can say that um the sacrifice a parent has to make to be involved in their kindergartner or first graders education that's required for remote learning is not feasible for every parent to do you know my husband and i have actually changed our schedule so significantly so that my son is never alone when he's online not every parent has the flexibility to do that um and there are many students who are alone uh, for the entire day in my son's class. And it's just like, I read, wrote in the chat, took the, it took the teachers almost a month to teach the students how to mute and unmute themselves because their parents were not there. And their parents have mixed knowledge of technology and English is often not their first language, it's an additional language. So learning the language of technology in a language that isn't your first language. I mean, it's just a little, anyway, but we're, we're right, rising to meet those challenges. It's not all bad. But I think Ken picked up on a lot of great stuff in terms of um, of students, even no matter what grade level, we know that students are developing these skills, these technology skills. My son is six years old and he can navigate the entire Google Classroom suite. Like I'll open up his homework and he's like, no, you need to open that up in slides. Like, you know, he is completely fluent, like even more fluent than I am. And it's only taken him just a few months to get to that point, though he does have the benefit of having the technology there, having me and my husband there and English being his first language. So, you know, we also have to think about that equity thing all the time. Equity, equity, equity. My son happens to be very privileged in this case. So you know, he has a lot of benefits, but we are we are we, we do have some easy wins here. And I think Phil's point about, you know, getting the parents involved at different grade levels by by submitting things to them, by inviting them, by showing them videos is really huge. Now, Pearson does actually have a school called Connections Academy, um, which is a free online public school. Um, and they have done a little bit of, of research in this space that I can share with you. But in terms of like, Students are, are, you know, students who have regularly attended school have progressed in these levels according to these tests. We don't have that data yet. But we recently conducted a study um, in the United States with a thousand randomly se selected families with kids. Now, we don't have it broken down in terms of like which age groups these kids belong to. So that's something, you know, I'm sure if they just polled kids with ki parents with kids in first grade, <laughs> they would get very different responses than if they mostly polled parents with kids in high school. Um, but what they found is that 43% um, of the parents said that post pandemic, they wanted a mix of online and in-person learning. They also found that 70% of the parents liked online learning because it builds future skills, self-sufficiency and resilience. And they could see those results in their kids. 
Um, also, uh, with well-designed content and teachers specially trained to personalize um, this instruction, 60% said they'd consider staying with online school over in-person school once the pandemic is over. So consider this is US, US parents, 1,000, only 1,000 parents, but the results are fairly positive. You know, they can see these, these, these easy wins, these soft skills, this resilience, this trying again. They see this in their students, it's coming out, and they realize the benefits of hybrid learning, even though it's been a quite a huge challenge. Hmm. Very interesting, and, and perhaps that we something that we need to point out. Just check around the table. Yes, Ken wanted to say something there. Yeah, just to, back to the hybrid learning thing. Just an idea of you know doing things. It is choices. It is choices that teachers make. So again, Phil mentioned this. It is a choice that you're going to say, okay, I'd like to take my students to the museum or do something. I teach a course right now, I, and I, I know we've been mostly talking about primary and secondary students. I teach adults. I teach uh, doctoral students right now. And uh, I've got 11 doctoral students in my class for discourse analysis. Now, another professor taught the same course. He gave them a sheet of, you know, of the discourse, you know, 20 pages of discourse, analyze this. Everybody's doing the same thing. They're all competing. You know, uh, what, what, what books are you using? None of your business, right? You know, they, they don't want to share anything else. I flipped the paradigm. I said, I want you to collect the discourse yourself. So again, going out into the community and, you know, bring that in and then do the analysis. What, what happens? Because they're all doing something slightly different on the same theme, they collaborate. They say, oh, what are you using? Oh, I'm doing this and this. And they're actually, I get them to post their papers and their transcripts on the discussion forum. They share it. And so they're discussing each other's. They're peer editing. I don't even have to ask them to do it, but they're giving feedback, everything else. So I think it's really important to emphasize, you know, Phil's point is that it is choices and you have the same syllabus in front of you, but you have to figure out how are you going to address it? And uh, if you can, if you can take some more creative choices, you'll be better off. Yeah, um, I just wanted to pick something up there because uh, Leonor is, is, is here and I wanted to argue something that comes from a comment in the chat that this is very dependent on the country and the culture. So I wonder, listening to Autumn, who's obviously talking about the United States, you're in a very different environment. Do you feel that there are cultural issues here and, and, and how, do we, how do we work with those? I don't know if there are cultural issues um, as some other type of issues. I mean, the idea that, I mean, as Autumn was saying, when both parents work, and even if they are working at home from home office, I mean, things are very difficult and challenging for learners and uh, for parents, and not everybody can be in charge of one of their kids helping them out. So I don't think it's a question of culture, but it's a question of the possibilities you have available. Uh, I was saying before, I mean, maybe in middle classes families, I mean, there aren't four computers that people can use at the same time, even though they may have uh, broadband and good internet access and a library and everything. But then the, uh, the possibilities of sharing uh, devices then is there. So not a cultural issue, a possibility issue. And something else I want to point out, as Phil was saying, I mean, in uh, as regards this idea of involving parents, sometimes showing them can be much more effective than just uh, sending information. So mm. you can think about home tasks. I mean, not just homework, but home tasks in which students may go out, if it's possible, just maybe in the neighborhood, but they can record themselves doing different things. I mean, posting videos that you can then upload onto the school blog. So parents and families will see their children working in English at home. Mm. And that is a benefit. And sometimes Autumn was saying that sometimes parents are not that techy. And uh, maybe parents, in our case, I mean, which English is a second language or an additional language, parents don't know English. Or if they do, they know about English. So they're focusing on conjugations and do and does and those things which do not help learners match because they may ask, okay, conjugate the verb to be. And maybe learners, I mean, young learners have no idea of the verb to be because they've always seen is, am, and are. So uh, that's something that we teachers have to consider when we involve families. I mean, show them how they can help children and give children the responsibility of doing different things in English at home, record themselves, 
so that there's a record that we can share with uh, with families. I guess that's the way it works. It's not so, it's not so much a cultural issue, but uh, the possibilities that we have. And, and as you said, that many parents perhaps experience language learning in a very different way from how language learning takes place now. Phil, I saw first and then I saw Ken, so I'm going to go in that order. <laughs> so, so as I mentioned, well, the, the first thing that happened when things went more, when, when synchronous learning went online, was a lot of 21st century language skills went out of the window. What's happened since has been the opposite. So, so we've got, um, what's the old adage? We have 20th century teachers teaching 21st century students in 19th century buildings with 18th century methodology or something or another. Um, so, so the aspects of actually becoming digitally literate uh, and, and Autumn mentioned her six-year-old son who can glide through uh, Google Classrooms and be also citizenship. Now, I, I know for, for a few years, Pearson has been offering these live classes uh, where students from different countries can actually uh, attend lessons at the same time. And I'm lucky enough to have lots of contacts. So I've had a few lessons with other students. And, and I find that, 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 that students are more discerning, certainly secondary level. Um, Ken's got his 19-year-old son at university. I've got a lot of 19-year-old students who are going to university. And they want skills that they can actively use and progress in their university careers. They're not happy. They're not satisfied with the regular, let's do the test and tell me how many points you got anymore. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, great. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. Um, just going back to an earlier point that everybody else has made is, is basically reaching out to the parents. And I think that's absolutely fantastic and I think it's vital but but this just raises a very small issue teacher time teacher time teachers spend so much time and I've just I've heard so many stories about them working right through the weekend creating you know redoing syllabi creating everything else and and basically it's just an expectation that they have unlimited time when in many cases they have young children of their own at home that they're also trying to adjust to so just as an administrative issue I think I think this has to be raised in some schools just to say listen your your expectations of what teaching is have changed, my preparation hours have changed, everything you're expecting me to do, I, we need to redo the schedule so that I'm not working 99 hours a week. So that's just, yeah, one point, yeah. I wonder, if, Jane, if we have a moment, I wonder if I could just raise a slightly different issue or are we just about out of time here? Uh, no, we're fine. Are you on for another 10 minutes? That's what I'm mm -hmm. aiming to do. I Great. hope everybody's okay. able to do that. I've got one more question on the list, but you go okay. you go with yours first. <laughs> I just, just because we were talking about some of the positives of hybrid learning and online learning, I just wanted to mention one is that what I found, so I've been teaching online graduate students and doctoral students for the past 10 years. Um, and uh, my my doctoral work in 2001 was on computer assisted language learning. So I'm kind of in the, in the, in the space, but an unexpected thing for me was the intimacy of it all. Uh, I'm finding it's actually it's actually more intimate than a regular classroom and I can give this anecdote to sort of support this. So one of my students, John, he was in Tokyo and uh, he wrote me in you know at the beginning of the year he said uh, he said uh, um, uh, we're pregnant. He put that on the discussion forum. So he and his wife, his wife, I assume, uh, was pregnant. And but you know, he shared that information. So I'm thinking to myself, would somebody do this in a graduate seminar, sitting around? You know, if I had a, you know 30 students in a classroom at you know an old brick building somewhere, would somebody stand up and sort of shout out this sort of information? So I, I find a lot of sharing of that information. Fast forward, fast forward nine months. John writes me again. He happens to be in another course I'm offering, and he says. Uh, I may not be here on Friday night because we're expecting any day now. I said, that's fine, John, you know, good luck, all those sorts of things. And then on Friday, who pops open his computer? John, he's at home. I said, oh, John, and I already know the baby's come because on Wednesday when the baby arrived, again, in the discussion forum, you know, it's all announced there. So we start talking, congratulations. And then I say, is the baby home? Let me get her. So he goes in the other room, brings out this two-day-old baby to show the class. It's like 20 seconds of the class time, but you know, my heart is just, you know, 
breaking. It's just wonderful. So again, I found I found so many incidents like that where I, you know, you get insights into the lives of the students. And I just don't think I would have gotten them if I was just addressing a class of students that rolled in and rolled out of the class. So yeah, anyway, that's I don't know if other people have those experiences, yeah. And that brings us actually to our last question, which I'll get everybody some input on that, but it's the same topic, Phil, so we can keep going, um, which is about the kind of emotional side, because people and some of you in the chat have commented on the emotional effect, perhaps, um, of being absent away from classmates and so on. So how do we look after people's kind of emotional state? And um, what are the, you know, what are the needs that, that people have? And how can we support our students in what are, you know, quite worrying times also for, for a lot of them. I'm going to start with Autumn, um, but I'll go around everybody after that. Autumn, what do you think about that? Supporting social e needs and, and emotional needs. So what I had prepared for this is based off of um, a paper that we can share later and kind of the basis for many of our frameworks here at Pearson that we use to build our products off of from a learning design standpoint. Um, you know, developing social and emotional skills, like social and emotional learning is this whole curriculum that you think about like a shadow curriculum underneath your curriculum. And especially when you're dealing with, <laughs> oh, I love, I've got to know so many cats. Oh my gosh, same, the Zoom meetings and the cats. It's definitely something, sorry, don't mean to be distracted by the, uh, by the chat. Um, but basically it's a shadow curriculum and the younger the students are, the more it's like a simultaneous learning of content and social and emotional learning. And basically, you know, I have I have some tips to share. I don't want to go over it in too much detail because I want everyone to be able to share their their input on this. But it's basically breaking it down into directly teaching skills to support social and emo emotional learning, modeling your practice of social and emotional learning, and then leveraging the norms that you've created in your in your classroom to provide that support and additional modeling of social and emotional learning. So what does that mean? in online blended and or hybrid learning. Um, it's it's kind of, I'm, I'm kind of speaking to this a little bit from a K through, K, like a, a primary elementary perspective, but it applies to any age group, even adults, is it's that we have to create this real structure, this real regular structure where students know exactly what they're going to get every single day. Um, they know that the day is going to start this way, and go here and go there and go there. And then as a teacher, you're planning in that, those check-ins. So the students know that they have a specific time, even once a week or once a day, where they're able to talk to their teacher or talk to their classmates and communicate how they're feeling. You know, a problem that we have had, I know I keep speaking to the United States, but I'm no longer an international jet setter because I have two very young children. So I'm very connected to this context here. Um, but it's it's really it's really in the United States the challenge is like there's so much of a focus on the kids falling behind in the academic sector sector like they're so worried about kids falling behind academically that for the first eight months of hybrid learning there was no focus on checking in with the kids emotional well being it was all about like do you know how to do the math. Are you developing your, are you reading 20 minutes a day? Please tell me, can you write a sentence? You know, just like losing everything. And now there's been a big shift. You know, the teachers, the teachers are monitoring engagement. The teachers are not being so strict about the microphones and the, and the video. They're checking in with the parents and saying, why doesn't your child turn on the video? They're checking in with the kid and saying, why don't you turn on the video? Because they need to know why. Maybe the kid is embarrassed. They don't want them to see where they live. Maybe the kid feels like it's an invasion of privacy. I don't want my classrooms to see me lying down in bed while I'm in this lesson or, or I'm not feeling well. I don't want to have my camera on. So it's all of these kind of things. And I have a whole a whole bunch of things I can share with you. I'll put together a, a, something, a resource that then we can upload to the website. But I also do want uh, you to know that we have a, a whole teacher education and learning catalog here at Pearson. Um, um, and we uh, I will also send the link to that. And we have a course that's called Teaching for Impact. And it has a series of online modules that focus on those really tricky parts of on the slippery parts of online teaching and learning, really focusing on that social emotional stuff, those soft soft skills that are super hard to teach online. So I think I think you should check that out. We also have a global citizenship course for teachers 
to build um, to build that, focusing specifically on our our personal and social capability framework. And within that, we have a DEI course on diversity, equity, and inclusion that encourages self reflection and open communication with teachers mm -hmm. that then they can model with their students. I'm super excited about this. I fed back on it. One of my colleagues just built it from the ground up. It's incredible. So there's a lot. There's a lot. So I promise to put this all together and send it out to right. you. And I want to now give others a chance to speak. Great. Autumn, we will make sure that we put that part of Some of it can go in the goodie bag, which everybody gets. And some of it can also go in the emails where you get your certificates. So we'll make sure everybody gets those resources and those links. Phil's been waiting to say something. So I'm going to pass over to you now. OK, so so three things very quickly. Uh, again, to, to, to echo uh, Ken, um, I've had three students who at the beginning of the year, I was told that they wouldn't be able to attend uh, regular classes because of special needs, social anxieties, uh -huh. everything else. Those three students have all joined online. And so, <laughs> so sometimes we can look at it the other way. The other thing is, in a normal school, I would be walking between lessons. And so there's, there's normally a break of five or 10 minutes, depending on the school, between each lessons. I always start my classes or I turn on the, 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 the link uh, 10 minutes beforehand. And students know that they can join and they can talk about other issues before the lesson oh. starts. So it's a way of taking their temperature and we, 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 we find out how their week's going. Uh, and again, it's all about horses for courses. Uh, I teach, I think, about 12 classes. I have two classes where we solve the camera issue. Um, they've been put in groups of five or six. And those five or six are the ones that have to turn their cameras on. And it's got really bizarre. So the ones that, because they, they're all on group chat, the ones that turn their cameras on, uh, last lesson, they were all wearing um, sort of dance or, or jackets and ties and, and cocktail dresses. And then a lesson beforehand, we had five of them in cosplay. So part of the, the thrill is, is, is what are the five going to do? And each, each group tries to outdo the other group. No, it depends on the classes. As I said, I've got I've got two classes that do it, but you know you have to be flexible. That's such a fantastic idea. I know that people who are responding in the chat will be copying that idea. It's a great one. Just to finish, we have just a couple of minutes left. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go round the group, just asking you for a, a one-liner, and I mean a one-liner. What do you think about? The future. What does the future hold for us um, in hybrid learning? I'm going to start with Leonor. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I'm sure you can. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. No worries. Uh, I'll make it short. It's uh, realizing that the future is in our hands as teachers or as parents, and uh, we need to embrace it. Fantastic. Now over to Autumn. What do you think the future holds? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to get Charlie the link so that you can send them out right away. I think I think the future is going to look very different from the past and it holds an exciting new horizon of a combination. It's like it's like with 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 energy we're moving from from the old forms of energy to new forms of energy but while we're doing that we have this middle ground, right? So I think we're going to be in that middle ground of education between the old way and the new way for a while and it's really exciting. It certainly is. Thank you. Over to you Ken. Um, I think brutal change, uh, you know, things, books when they came out, computers when they came out, you know, so many new technologies, the web when they came out, brutal change. And it takes a little while to settle it out and find those best, best practices. But, you know, for all the people attending today, making that effort to continue their learning, thank you, those teachers, because that's how it happens. We get some new ideas, we share them, and we try acting on them and find the best thing to do to go forward. Great reflection. And finally, Phil, I'm going clockwise around my screen. It's Wind you. down the window, push down the accelerator, feel the wind in your hair and enjoy the change. <laughs> Lovely. Great. Well, it's great to hear 
this, as somebody's just said in the chat, a lively discussion and lots of energy here um, from us to you. And I hope also that, that you feel positive about, about the future and, and what it holds for you. Um, one thing the future holds for you is a certificate, a goodie bag, <laughs> and um, all the links and um, research insights that Autumn has just mentioned. So we'll be getting those over to you um, very soon. So looking forward to seeing you in more Pearson English events. And thank you very much for coming. Bye-bye.